My name is James Evan Jones. I'm going to read Merry Christmas from the Nam. And by the way, fuck you. Let's see. In 1967, at age 20, I completed Navy gunnery school outside Chicago. I spent my last leave with my family in the suburbs of California. In October, and on October 7, 1967, flew to Saigon en route to the Mekong Delta to join the Mobile Riverine Force at Dongtan, near Mito and Ben Trey. As a child of the 60s, I expected to die. And why not? The war was on nightly news and gruesome detail. Kennedy was killed. The Russians almost nuked us after Bay of Pigs. A neighbor died of a coat hanger abortion. And my uncle was building a bomb shelter. With zero ceremony, I gave my favorite things to my three younger brothers. My books, my comic collections, bow and arrow, fishing gear, record albums, and my Kit Carson style leather jacket. I was certain I would not come back alive. <clears throat> However, exactly a year after landing in Saigon, on October 8th, 1968, I was ready to board a commercial jetliner for Travis Air Force Base near my home. I had slept in a small hotel with clean sheets, a large bamboo ceiling fan rotating lazily above me, and a bottle of water with wriggling mosquito larvae in it beside my bed. Nonetheless, I was content in the room, especially because three months earlier in Saigon, I was sleeping alone in an army barracks when a 122 millimeter Soviet rocket exploded near enough that in my sleep, I cleared my bunk horizontally and hit the deck. So yeah, I was freaky about getting blown up in a barracks my last night in country, hence the hotel. Jittery all night <clears throat> at 3 a.m., I caught a taxi to the airport. First guy on the plane, <clears throat> I didn't figure that first on, then my sea bag was first in and last out of the cargo hold. The plane landed two hours late, but there on the other side of a cyclone fence was my dad, mom, and girlfriend. Looking nice and like home. You've been waiting long? I asked my pop. Just a year, he said without missing a beat. Perfect. Honest to Christ, the flight was 26 hours, but I still reeked of Vietnam. Sweaty, clammy, stinky, like red dust and diesel fumes were jammed into my pores. I was packing uh, buku mundane memories and a few psych heavy ones like souvenirs from the war, <clears throat> being afraid of stubbing my toes running barefoot and almost naked to my gun mount, helping hoist a bloated GI out of the river, looking into the, into the glassy eyes of a dead soldier, his skin ink black and beautiful with only one tiny drop of deep red blood on his cheek to herald his death. <clears throat> being happy to wash my hair, even without soap from a randomly placed spigot in an almost deserted helicopter base. Feeling my lungs twitch in my chest <clears throat> from the concussion of a 500 pound bomb. Waking up in a whore's room, confused and angry, tangled in her soggy, gritty sheets for the simple satisfaction of crushing flies with a roll of toilet paper while crapping in the bunkhouse like latrine at the 93rd Avac Hospital at Long Bin after my ears got blown up. There was something that I didn't figure on, something it took a decade to realize. Dates <clears throat> went unnoticed or lost all meaning over there. And in fact, the date could be ruined if you were forced to remember it. Like the army grunts and our vans at Dacto, they paid heavily in another savage fight for another hill that we abandoned soon after taking it. After the three week bloodbath, some dipshit officer decided to fly in the turkey dinner because it was the day before Thanksgiving. Well, guess what? <clears throat> that holiday was about as wrecked as Hill 875 and the uh, Buku US North, North Vietnamese soldiers and US troops who never really went home. For the rest of their lives, those troops dreaded Thanksgiving and the haunting dreams they could not outrun. For me, the shit memory was a Viet Cong attack on the base of Dong Tam, one I watched from close up from our floating tub of a barracks ship. At, at the time, it was Christmas that was fucked up for me, but without a crappy dinner.
In Vietnam, no matter if you were a clerk living in a hooch on the beach with a gorgeous woman, or you were a boony rat pounding your pud in your rack, you lived day to day, not caring if it was October 29 or November 15. What did matter, what was very important, was that day out of 365. Unless you re upped, you served one year and then you went home. Exactly 365 days after landing in country, you left, flew stateside on a commercial jetliner out of Saigon or Da Nang. So it mattered a great deal if it was day 29 or day 229, and especially day 329, because then you were short. We didn't have regular calendars. We had short timers calendars. Each FNG, fucking new guy, went through the same drill. After a week or so, Scotty, the second class gunner, would give you a piece of paper with a mimeographed outline of a playmate, her body blank, except for 365 jigsaw style pieces. Every night before racking out, you'd color in another piece. And as the naked lady took shape, you knew you were that much closer to leaving, to going home. I only knew one guy who re-upped. Laura was his name, but we called him Silky. He did it for the money, and he signed on for six more months. Not extra combat pay. He did it for the crap games. He bet half his paycheck on the first pass of the dice. If he won, he was off and throwing dice all night. If he busted, he'd take one more pass with the rest of his pay, either play or walk away from the game. I knew he won at least $18,000 because I bought money orders for him. We all did, since the clerk wrote down how much you sent home. There was some limit. But for the rest of us, we just wanted to do our time and go home. Holidays didn't matter a whit, except as one more day towards short. Like I said, <clears throat> I was a Navy gunner's mate assigned to the River Flotilla 1 in Mekong Delta. I had the luck, turned out to be good luck, to be stationed on the barrack ship the USS Benalla. It was an LST during an earlier war, but now it was a floating barracks with guns. It was a big green tub towed around on the rivers. It carried army companies of the 9th Infantry and 25 heavily armed boats tied to pontoons alongside it. I say I had the luck because crappy as the duty was, I knew, I know, I would not have lived had I been stationed on one of the boats that hauled the army grunts up the canals. In one month, our boat crew suffered 70% casualties. One month, seven out of 10 guys were wounded or killed. I saw the boats come back blown up, twisted, jagged steel where the narrow gun turrets used to be. And in each one, there used to be a gunner's mate. The bar armor, rebar really, fortified with cases of sea rations, didn't stop the armor-piercing rockets fired at almost point-blank range. No, I didn't have the kind of luck it took to go home whole after that. But then, neither did Silky. His luck ran out when we traveled far upriver to Parents Beak by Cambodia. When the boats came back, Silky's turret was all jagged, twisted, and busted up, and he was bagged up and gone. Later, and on our usual patrol, we were at anchor in the river by the channel to Dong Tan. The base was about a half mile from us, close to the small city of Mito. And all I usually saw were hooches when we motored in small boats up the Kinjang Canal to the base. I was on the 8 to midnight watch in the quad 40 gun, gun tub up on the bow, manning a 50 caliber machine gun with a starlight scope so the feeble nightlight was magnified and you could see green tinted shapes in the darkness. I watched for sappers and mines placed in floating debris. If anything looked suspicious, I would call the officer on deck and ask permission to shoot it or toss a concussion grenade in the water. Jankowski was on the deck outside the mouth listening to his battery powered radio and waiting for his watch. We called him Jan because it was already a bosun's mate named Ski. Jan the Gunner was from Chicago, and he loved to eat in expensive restaurants stateside. And he told funny stories about going to those places alone or with a date, like when the girl with him started spooning the water from the finger bowl after dinner. He claims he salted his water and started using his spoon too. Anyway, Jan was listening to the Armed Forces radio station out of Saigon. They were playing Christmas music, which was incongruous because with the smothering heat, 
the monsoons, the rice paddy, or the otherwise ubiquitous lush and impenetrable jungle growing by the water's edge, it didn't seem like Christmas. But now it was black, black as only a primitive, rural, electricity-free land can be, when nothing but far-off bomb flashes interrupt the darkness. Darkness? Yeah, dark. And then, in an instant, the night's cloak over the basin was shredded by explosions of white light, small streamers of gold and red shooting away from them. Another mortar attack by the Viet Cong. Our alarm gong sounded for general quarters, and the PA system carried the bosun's voice. General quarters, general quarters, all hands manned their battle stations. I was already at mine. So I broke open the ammo lockers and loaded the quad 40s and otherwise watched the show as my crew ran to the mount. We stood at the gun tub and watched, waited and watched in case any of the shit storm came our way. The mortar rounds continued but were now being answered by 105 howitzers, probably shooting willy-nilly in a free fire zone. Then choppers took off to the sky. Our mortars fired parachute flares that popped, hissed, and burned with an almost metallic light and drifted down to the jungle canopy. The Hueys started firing their 60s and the VC heavy automatic weapons answered from the ground. Then they fired rockets into the base. All this was in bright colors, looking like they were sprayed from a phantasmic soldiers, a soldier unit. Our tracers were in red. Every fifth bullet left a red streak so the gunners could aim better. But what's fired down often ricocheted up in reddish V patterns. The VC had orange tracers, and they were shooting at the choppers buzzing above them. The rockets left sparkly green trails as they arced towards the base. The howitzer rounds burst brilliantly in scorching white phosphor streamers or orange bursts, looking graceful as they searched for bodies to fling into the air like leaping jungle creatures. During this display of beauty and death, Jan had abandoned his radio on the deck by my gun mount. It was still cranking out Christmas music. Little drummer boy was playing. I watched, I listened. The staccato beats were amplified and illustrated with explosions. This was absurd, unholy, a celestial symphony conducted by an antichrist. No one seemed to notice the juxtaposition of light and sound but me. I was transfixed, completely mesmerized by this ghoulish spectacle. And later, at midnight, when it was long over, Chan came to relieve me. I gave him his forgotten radio. I tried to describe what I saw and heard, but he just said, BFD, for big fucking deal. So I went to my rack and didn't think about it anymore. But the next morning, there were eight body bags lined up on the tarmac. And now, after all these years, and as you might imagine, I sincerely do not like to hear the little drummer boy. It's only a piece of Christmas, but it always drags me back to Dongtan, to that diabolical symphony with perverted sounds and colors. I can see it, I do every year. I can hear it, I do every Christmas. I just can't smell it. BFD, right? <laughs>